Welcome to the Ukraine Lab launch hosted by the British Library. I'm B. Rolatz of the Cultural Events team and in the library we're really excited about tonight's event. It's a really special one for us both in its ambition and its content. Uh, our writers tonight will be exploring the global challenges of war, disinformation and climate change through the prism of Ukraine and the arts of storytelling. And I want to thank you, the audience, joining us tonight for not tuning out of events in Ukraine, for not looking away. We don't need to get overwhelmed. We can all learn from Ukrainian resistance. That's why we're here tonight. So please send your questions in at any time uh, using the box below here on the platform. And Sasha will put those questions to our speakers. And this brings me to the inimitable Sasha. Dr. Sasha Dovzik is your guide for the evening. She is a special project curator at the Ukrainian Institute London. She's an associate lecturer in Ukrainian at UCL. Uh, she does a huge amount of work uh, with journalists reporting the war alongside her own dispatches, which you can read on her website. And I really recommend you take a look. I love her tracing of the work of the feminist icon Lesia Ukrainka, a poet whose work embodies the idea of willpower transcending physical suffering. In Sasha's words, to understand Ukraine's resistance to Russia, you must look to the pages of the nation's poetry books. Tonight, we're looking into the pages of Ukraine and the UK's future writers. Over to you, Sasha. Thank you to the British Library, our absolutely fantastic hosts and partners for this event, and not only. Um, I'm delighted to speak to you from London about the project that uh, builds bridges between the UK and Ukraine, uh, while also opening Ukrainian culture to the world. Ukraine Lab is this sort of laboratory. Um, it's a writing residency in the first place that we, the Ukrainian Institute London, developed in partnership with Pan Ukraine and Ukrainian Institute in Kiev as part of the UK-Ukraine season of culture, which is supported by the British Council. Uh, this very special writing residency united three emerging authors from Ukraine and three emerges, or emerging authors from the UK, and they worked collaboratively for six weeks over the summer on their creative nonfiction pieces. Uh, creative nonfiction means that their essays are rooted in documents, are rooted in facts, in, in lived experiences, and yet they possess this creative approach to storytelling, which for me makes them magical. Uh, why Ukraine Lab? That's uh, sort of the, the, the mystery of the name. Uh, the thing is that Ukraine has often been called a laboratory when it comes to global challenges, uh, be it ecological emergencies like the Chernobyl nuclear disaster, or Kremlin-led disinformation campaigns, or the impacts of modern war. And Ukrainians, as we all have learned by now, have responded to all these challenges with creativity, with resilience, and uh, their responses have turned Ukraine into this treasure trove of cultural resistance strategies. Um, we believe that it is high time now for all of us, for the world, to learn the lessons of Ukrainian resistance. Um, and to do that, we will emerge, uh, immerse ourselves in the art of storytelling. The six writers that have been selected to participate in this online writing residency were asked to reflect on the global challenges related to security, to the environment, to information uh, in their essays. For six weeks over the summer, they learned about Ukrainian experiences from a global perspective, from their very respected mentors, about whom I'll uh, tell you a few words a bit later. Um, the writers were also lucky to learn the craft of writing from the incredible authors and lecturers, um, Julia Bell from Bergbeck and David Saddle from the University of uh, Salford, as well as the Ukrainian poet Irina Shuvalova. Another thing that uh, for me makes Ukraine Lab so special is the visual component. The pieces by the six participants were visually interpreted by an absolutely um, astonishing and talented Ukrainian photographer, Mstislav Chernov, 
Um, Spislav um, has been on the front lines of this war, which of course has not started this February, but uh, eight years ago in February 2014, for all this time, he was documenting uh, Ukrainian resistance and this fight and uh, some of his images from Mariupol have won him dozens of awards already. Um, he developed very special artworks in response to the pieces by the six Ukraine lab authors, and you'll be able to see some of his works tonight. Um, but uh, what makes Ukraine lab such a success? Um, and I'm obviously not at all partial here. I think it's uh, an amazing success. It's the cohort of writers we've attracted. A pretty unique thing is that all the UK-based authors have traveled to Ukraine independently, and they are all incredibly committed to the cause. Ukrainian authors are a, mix a mixture of unique voices from the West, the East, and the capital of the country, and they are truly inspirational. And I can wax lyrical about all of them. Um, for the next hour or so, but uh, it's probably wise for us to listen to the authors themselves. Uh, just a technical issue. Uh, as you may know, there is a problem with electricity in Ukraine, and if there is a blackout and we lose connection with some of our authors, we'll try to reconnect them as soon as we can, so please bear with us. And uh, of course, if there is an air raid alert, this is also part of the reality of life in Ukraine these days. So please bear with us. And um, I hope this uh, evening will continue without any interruptions. So first of all, we will watch the reading of two pieces that focus on war. Uh, the mentor for this thematic blog was uh, Olesa Hromichuk, a writer, scholar, um, theater maker and accidentally the director of the Ukrainian Institute London. Um, Olesa shared with the participants her thoughts on staging a play and writing a book about the experiences of trauma, loss, grief uh, caused by Russia's war against Ukraine. Uh, the first writer you'll hear from is Sofia Chelak, a translator to be presenter and program director of the Lviv International Book Forum. Her piece, Ukrainian Lottery, Lottery sorry, describes the first days of the full-scale invasion in the westernmost Ukrainian city of Lviv. And the second reading will be by Chris Mikhailovich, an international volunteer and writer focusing on Eastern Europe. His essay, Luhansk Stolen, moves between the Eastern Ukrainian city of Luhansk and um, Kharkiv, the second largest Ukrainian city that has been shelled mercilessly by the Russians since February. Um, these pieces have already been published in Mir Online and in English and in Ukrainian in Pirzhen. So please, when you have a moment, just Google them and have a read. They are worth it. The bilingual translations are by our brilliant translator Nina Murray. Uh, so let's enjoy the first pair of readings. Adrenaline roller coaster puck. If you are going to spread pessimism, I'll kick you out of the apartment. Better let me show this video of you of how our nice bioctars blow up Russian tanks. Look, there was a column of tanks. Can you see them? And now there is not. I look up with tears in my eyes. But what if you lose Kiev? What if you never got Mariupol and Kharkiv back? The waves of adrenaline that made us capable of working two or three jobs and volunteering between would give way to deep pits of despair. Whenever that happened, the most important job was to support the person, to pull them out as quickly as possible and then to keep walking, 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 leaving on no opportunity for another fall. Even if they take them, we'll get them back. Look, 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 a nice little biochar is flying through the sky, and there are fields below, pretty summer fields. Boom! Feel better? If not, I'll give you my wine. There is six sips are not going to make a difference. 
Thank you. It's a little better. I can't take your wine. We watch a lot of Russian content to, to understand what people were there were concerned about. It was a sick, but we could not stop. All of us least read Russians, and this gave us the two too. Let's be frank about it. Locate some hope uh, that their society would recognize, would protest, that they would begin fighting the regime from inside while we battle in the front line. Our hopes were in vain. Instead, we saw Instagram stories about the pain of uh, sanctions. Are you serious? And threats to our presidents. To think of yourself separated from Luhansk was to imagine yourself in a vacuum. But now you felt at last the need to leave, to follow the whisperings of sleep and feel the things you saw and touched in dreams. You stood in line with the pensioners at Stanitsa Luhansk, feeling like you were about to cross the river Styx to go back into the world of the living. The Russians at the crossing asked if you had a boyfriend and looked at you like you were an item in a warrior's harem. They were so beguiled by you and their boredom, they neglected to search your bags. You wondered if all it took was a smile for you to be able to smuggle bombs for the resistance and copies of Kobzar back across the demarcation line undetected. You followed your friends to Kharkiv and enrolled at university, where for four years of total freedom, you jumped at every loud noise and lay awake at night, worried for your parents. Then the Russians decided Kharkiv was also their city. So once again, just like the day they shelled your street back in Luhansk at the start of it all, you crouched for the last time in fear of the murderous sky. I should just say that I love the way that these uh, recordings uh, mix the visuals and the literary text, and I can't thank the British Library enough for this. Um, I'm also delighted to see Sophia and Chris on my screen for the first time since the summer, and uh, I've, I've been missing you a lot, guys. Um, my first question, my first two questions are for Sophia. Uh, first of all, um, where are you now? Let us know. And second of all, uh, your title for your essay is Ukrainian Lottery. Could you explain the concept behind the title and behind uh, your essay? Could you tell us a bit more about that? Hi, Sasha. Hi, everybody. I'm so delightful to be here. Like, it's so crazy. I'm like, we all having a reading in British libraries. Thank you. Thank, thank you. A lot of thanks to Ukrainian Lab and all of the partners to make it possible. I am uh, in Lviv now. It's quite safe. And also, we don't have blackout. Yes, we are quite privileged. Uh, as a rule, we are privileged. Um, Secondary connect to uh, your question. Why it's a lottery? Mm, I've started to work on this text after um, after I visited Kiev a lot uh, in spring. After I was to Irpin Bucha and I was talking to a lot a lot of people. Of course, it was a lot of sad stories, but people who can be victims as a rule they were lucky to have this lucky ticket to stay alive then during the ukraine lab i was i have a chance to visit kharkiv and i've been there like for two days and also it was a lot for you in the night uh when uh, in the night when we stayed we stayed there it was like 12 missiles falling down uh, for the city and it hasn't harmed anyone that night. After we left Kharkiv to come to the Kharkiv region, uh, like really close to the front line, we were lucky to leave Kharkiv, not to come to Saltivka as we were like firstly planning. Because of that day, front line was moving and Russia 
artillery started to hit the buildings. So we were the person to have this lucky ticket. You know, uh, like it was mentioned, I was uh, I am leading the festival we book forum, and this year we got um, festival in. Live basically uh, in a partnership with the Hay Festival, but after we have to have um, the like an official program with some writers coming to Kiev, like and having some experience, like to see the Kiev region, to meet pe people in Kiev, and we just arrived on 10th of October when the huge bombing uh, has started. But we were also lucky. First of all, we were like safe, like staying in bomb shelters, the area we were like, it was like pretty safe. But secondly, you know, we finished uh, the festival evening before Lviv was uh, uh, in the blackout for the whole day without connection. So like staying here is pretty safe. We are like still living our lives with like trying our best to live our lives. Uh, this My text is about this. Uh, because of Ukrainians are like hedonists. We are trying to live our lives as much as possible. But sometimes you're not lucky. Like till now, me, like me personally, I'm lucky to be alive to and to have a chance uh, visiting a lot of places and to become a nice and then become a voice of people sharing their stories. Thank you so much, Sophia, for being such a powerful and poignant voice and for being our eyes in the places that we can't reach. I think the first lesson of uh, Ukraine Lab is uh, reevaluating the concept of luck, because what you what you are saying about luck is quite different what most people in the West and in the world outside of Ukraine would uh, think of when they speak about luck. Thank you. And uh, my second question is for Chris. Uh, I'm also interested to hear where you are right now. Uh, and yeah, let us know. Where are you? I'm in the same place as Sofia. I'm also in Lviv right now. What brought you there? Uh, well, uh, initially, uh, this is my ancestral homeland. I'm from the UK. However, my, uh, my ancestors lived in the Lvivsky Oblast, in the Lviv region, very happily, or not, for many centuries until they were uh, displaced to the UK. So I was first brought here uh, by this ancestral connection. And, um, and what has kept me here is um, basically being in love with Ukrainian literature, Ukrainian culture, Ukrainian food, uh, Ukrainian everything. So uh, this explains why I'm in the same place as Sofia right now. Wonderful. Um, your uh, piece, Luhansk Stolen, is very emotional. And I'm just wondering, uh, is there something in particular you would like your audience to bear in mind after reading it or to feel or to think? Is there a message that you would like to convey with your piece? I, I can't say that it's a very cerebral piece. I, I, I didn't compose it with a certain message in mind, but um, to, be, to be very broad about it, I, I would hope anybody who reads it would, um, would either keep in mind or would learn that this, uh, the world's become very aware of Ukraine. Ukraine's very much on the world's mind since the 24th of February of this year. Uh, however, this wasn't the beginning of a new war. This 24th of February was the expansion of operations of a war that had been ongoing for eight years. Um, I felt it's important that people be aware of that. Uh, this war has been going on for much longer than probably most realize. Um, the other thing, too, is that my experience of um, I've volunteered across many post-conflict or current conflict zones in Europe. The, the tendency when a when a place becomes besieged is um, uh, the people living there become a kind of abstraction of war, of suffering. Um, it becomes a, a in a grotesque way a kind of form of um, theater. And uh, so, for example, I mean, uh, 
okay, I wrote about Luhansk, but let's use the example of Mariupol because people, uh, I think, in the national audience since February is far more aware of Mariupol. Um, this is a place that they, 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 when people think of it, they think of destruction, they think of, uh, of all of the horrible atrocities that go with, with an occupation. Um, it would likely not occur to many people that this was, in fact, a place very much like where they're from. Uh, so I, I hoped to write about Luhansk, uh, which, as I say, it could be a standard for Mariupol, for, for any occupied territory, really. Um, this is a place where people experience very similar things to what the reader does. Um, and the fact that I, I focused on um, somebody's, uh, the, the, the protagonist's adolescence, well, that demonstrates that their childhood, the childhood of the protagonist, could have been very much like the one of the reader had it not been for this very rude awakening of innocence uh, that comes in the form of, of Russian aggression and invasion. Um, so to, to keep it brief, I would say that's probably the two important points I, I would like readers to take away is that, um, number one, this war has lasted a lot longer than most people realize. And number two, uh, Luhansk or any other occupied, any other occupied part of Ukraine has a lot more in common with the readers, whoever the reader may be. The readers home found that they realize and your piece does a great work of bring, bringing those places in the pre-war life closer to us um, in the english language thank you so much and uh we will discuss uh all the pieces later in the general q a but uh, now i would like to move to our second thematic block which is environment um, Ukraine is sadly known as the site of the world's uh, worst nuclear catastrophe and is now, of course, the first country in the world where Russia has weaponized uh, objects of civilian nuclear infrastructure. Uh, moreover, we hear more and more calls to frame Russia's actions in Ukraine as ecocide. So uh, the environmental focus on Ukraine could not be more pertinent today um, and I'm very glad that Ukraine Lab covers this topic. The two writers who explored uh, the environmental subjects through the lens of Ukraine were mentored by uh, Tamara Hundrova. Tamara Hundrova is uh, the world's uh, leading um, environmental humanities scholar uh, who has also explored uh, the trauma of Chernobyl and how it played out in Ukrainian culture. I highly recommend her book, Post Chernobyl uh, Library. Uh, and the two pieces uh, have already been published in The Ecologist, which is uh, uh, one of the most high profile environmental uh, platforms in the English language, and in Ukrainska Pravda, which is a popular Ukrainian outlet. Um, the first Ukraine lab writer you'll hear from today is uh, Katerina Yakovlenko. She's a Luhansk-born visual culture researcher and writer, and also since recently a research fellow at the School of Slavonic and East European uh, Studies here in London at UCL. Uh, Katerina's piece is a poetic reflection on the social and environmental context of Eastern Ukraine and on the three elements that have shaped these contexts, salt, coal, and gas. Um, the piece is called, again, very poetically, Black, White, and Colorless. The second reading will be by Jonathan Turnbull, a cultural and environmental geographer researching the return of nature to the Chernobyl exclusion zone. Um, Jonathan's piece, Key of Thickets, drifts through the wild and weird green spaces of the capital of Ukraine, uh, the spaces you do not usually hear about called thickets. And in Johnny's words, these places are brimming with political potential. Uh, let's hear the readings now. The air is so heavy in the summer, you can hardly move your feet. Your body becomes heavy and it feels like your noisters are made of brick. You gasp for breath, 
like fish breath in by the powerful ocean wave. It is hard to tell if there is because of the bright step sun or the dust that warms its way into your clothes and skin. You, I cannot for whom how the miners who must wear their protective overalls every day and climb down into the gust of the blazing hot earth serve, serving in, in temperatures like this. I never ask my father about this. He used to work as a power engineer at mine. In winter, it's little easier, but the winds can be so strong. They send the very ground under your feet skidding in every direction. The local road crowds would put salt in the ice and bus roads. This is not always prevent injuries, but made it necessary to clean the white rosals of salt of your black fake leather shoes every night. The time was the late 19th and the beginning of new millennium. The bright colors of childhood were painted in the shadows of the gray every day. Endless high-rise buildings, modernist spaceship-like constructions, and gargantuan Soviet-era monuments of communists and workers. Before I arrived to Kiev as a naive PhD student, I pictured gray concrete and lots of it. And while my impressions formed from afar were not entirely false, they were lacking to say the least. It irks me that this grayness is the first and often only thing people think of when they imagine Kiev a city whose symbol is a horse chestnut leaf, begging us to find the green among the grey. June 2021, a year ago, a different world. We're gliding down the Dnipro on a riverboat at a fashion show by Mikhail Koptev, Ukraine's premier trash designer who left Luhansk for Kiev after Russia invaded Ukraine in 2014. Portside, we look up a hill past an all but fully nude catwalker into the greenery of Hrishko National Botanical Garden. Glancing starboard past a leaf sellotaped to the groin of another stumbling model, we see Hydro Park, one of several forested islands on the Dnipro which splits Kiev's right and left banks. My friends Grant and Hugo, who visit regularly from Berlin, are surprised by Kiev's green lushness, an aspect of the city which seems to get lost in translation. Kiev has been known as a green city in the reference books in Soviet times, but for many foreigners this comes as news. One afternoon, my friend Dmitro Chipurny and I were out for a wander. Dima, a researcher and curator from Luhansk, whose family home has been occupied since 2014, has lived in Kiev for 11 years and is well acquainted with the city's nooks and crannies. So what are they, these Kiev thickets, I asked, having never heard this term before. They're these green zones around the city, he replied, and they're filled with political potential. The key of thickets are, as the name suggests, dense patches of thick greenery that occupy the margins of the city, akin to the bracken of Berlin. Often liminal spaces suspended between rural and urban, nature and society, they are a gathering place for marginalised human communities and practices, as much as they are for endangered non-human species. Weekend Derives with Dima and his crew of artists, photographers and researchers allowed me to become intimately acquainted with several of the key of thickets, spending time with the more than human communities that call them home. Discussing environmental questions of Ukraine and vi environmental lessons of Ukraine. Um, thank you, uh, Sasha, and I'm also very happy to see uh, all of the participants and you and also be present in British Library. It's, it's a big honor to me to um, be here today. Um, and for me, uh, it was very challenging to participate in this lab in an environmental topic because I never was related to this. But then I understand that I was because I was uh, researched on bus. I researched on bus for six years from the cultural field, and I uh, look deeply to the connection between culture and violence. But then I recognize that all the topics that we are raising like gas oil and uh, salt from the economic perspective and even now talking about this as a local economical problem but of course with a connection with the European economical problem but this is also uh, deeply rooted in the environmental crisis and because of war it has no border uh, I mean of course uh, 
in, in international media, it's present still as a local issue and as Ukrainian problem, but we all know that it's not a Ukrainian problem. Um, so the environmental issue is quite uh, changing the perspective and it's give understanding of war and the, um, the war everyday life and the results of war um, globally. And um, especially when we understand how it's connected with uh, plants, with uh, animals, and then we see how many plants and animals are in danger right now, how many cities are destroyed, and that it's also connected with the pollution and how uh, difficult situation, uh, in, for example, in Mariupol with uh, health and um, uh, like lots of other uh, stuff. So it's it's gives understanding that Ukrainian war it's um it's a global issue right and we have to solve it and it's not uh and it's traditionally seen that we just have to stop uh being in war but it's not working <laughs> in this issue so we have to think how to uh really stop it but not with some peaceful dialogues dialogues or demonstration uh but but with some real actions that we have to do in international law in some like other fields as well but also i want to remind that um as we know uh that ukrainian war the uh, the russian war in ukraine have been started in spring 20 14 but uh in summer i was writing a piece and i was uh, remembering all the time the like uh, difficult connections uh and um between ukraine and russia and i remember myself that it was an accident in 2003 with um the man peninsula and russian forces want to like build uh sort of uh to they they call it they care uh, they was caring about the coastline of the taman peninsula but it, basically they want to stall ukrainian island called Zmini. so it was a huge international uh, precedent and uh, the problem was solved uh until the end of the year and then we know that the orange revolution have been started but the, basically the case wasn't been sold haven't been sold so it still was a huge uh problem for this demar demarcation line and this is also for me a big question how we recognize our territory in a um, global perspective that for one hand we of course seeing this as something which is uh, clearly could be marked in the map but still we have some parts on our um, border which is not uh very very clearly uh, marked as it was in this um, part of the territory on the Azov and Black Sea. So it's uh, lots of big questions and issue. And I was really happy to make this journey through Donbass uh, history and through the cases of the coal, uh, gas and uh, salt. Thank you, Katya. And yeah, we can't emphasize enough that this is not the first war year when the war has been raging and um, the global efforts to stop it have been insufficient so far. And this is actually our last wake up call. Um, Johnny, do, do you have something to add on the environmental uh, lessons for the rest of the world that can be learned from Ukraine today? Yeah. Um... Thanks, Sasha, for everything that you've done for all of us. And yeah, it's good to see everybody again on screen um, for the first time in a while. I was, yeah, I was thinking about this question. And um, I think what what's become clear is that the environment is intensely geopolitical and it's just kind of, you know, come right to the fore of everyone's attention. I think Ukraine's always been known as Europe's breadbasket, this place of intense um concentration of natural resources whether it be wheat or whether it be as katya is writing about in the donbass region coal gas salt um and i think just more like during this war we've seen these natural resources become weaponized we've seen ecocide we've seen attacks on infrastructure water energy all of these things um have become weapons of geopolitics the grain deal uh in the south of Ukraine and how, how how all of these natural resources are interconnected around the world. 
But I also think like kind of in the future as well, what we've seen is this reliance on Russian gas in Western Europe, another natural resource that is intensely political. Um, and the attempts, although they're, they're measly in comparison to what they should be, to shift away from this. We have seen instances of energy mixes being changed. Um, and I wouldn't say I wouldn't necessarily say it gives hope, but it, it, it shows that this system of fossil fuel dependence is malleable and needs to be going forward if you want a peaceful world where you can't be held to ransom. And so I think th those are the kind of like major ge geopolitical things that we can learn from Ukraine. And there's some excellent Ukrainian writers like Alexei Udinsky has written about the dependence on gas in Germany. Um, but then on, on like a more everyday level, like I write about it in my piece where these local natural environments, whether it be woodlands or forests or something like this, have become uncanny in 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 following the Russian invasion as they've, as they've been heavily mined and things like this. And so people's l l relationship with the land has been changed, much like, much like it was after the Chernobyl disaster. Um, and so, yeah, I think, you know, l l learning lessons from how people are, you know, coping in these uncanny environments is something that's an ongoing process and we'll have to do going forward. Thank you. I love a bit of hope coming from Johnny and uh, all the writers in this cohort are probably used to me being an absolute killjoy and then to, then to them just talking sense into me. Um, this is one of the brilliant outcomes of Ukraine Lab, just my um, improved mental health, I guess. Um, but now it's time for us to move to the third uh, topic of Ukraine Lab. Um, which is disinformation and Ukrainian perspectives on disinformation. Um, in recent years, the international community has been shaken by Russia's use of information as a weapon. And uh, from the US presidential election back in 2016, I think, uh, to the pandemic responses in 2020, um, the very bombardment of uh, the public with messages uh, that sabotage the very concept of truth has been taking place. Um, however, it is actually in Ukraine in 2014 that uh, the Kremlin has uh, tried out this tactic um, of hybrid warfare for the first time. Um, our writers have been mentored in uh, this area by uh, someone who needs no introduction, Peter Pomerantsev. He is the author of uh, Nothing is True and Everything is Possible, and This is Not Propaganda, the two very essential books on disinformation um, and our uh, life in cyberspace th these days. Um, the first reading will be by Phoebe Page. Uh, she is a master's student, a student in political sociology and since recently communications officer at the Ukrainian Institute London. Phoebe's piece is incredibly clever. Uh, it's called On Which Side? And it calls on the Western audiences to discern Ukrainian voices amidst the noise of Russian propaganda. And the second essay is by a brilliant uh, Ukraine-based, Kyiv-based author, Olena Kozar, who is a journalist, editor, and copywriter. Her piece is called How Do You Know? And it is a very poignant reflection on the effects of information overflow, which was a surprising topic for me. And uh, Olena has surprised me at every step of her writer's journey. So let's hear from these two writers now. In the hyper-online world where most of us watch Russia's war in Ukraine unfold from a distance, there is little information we cannot access. But having access is not enough. The most important thing is what we choose to do with that information. Reading an earlier draft of this piece, a British friend asked, what is the word no one wants to hear? I had fallen into the echo chamber trap of thinking everyone's Twitter feed was filled, like mine, with the same word, genocide. Had my friend not heard about the Kremlin's consistent denial of Ukrainian identity, about the filtration camps Ukrainians are being deported to, or about Putin publicly inciting the elimination of Ukrainians as a people? I listen to the news, she said, but it's so hard. Sometimes I turn it off. As with Rubin's optical illusion, all the information we need is in plain view, 
but so often our eye goes elsewhere. Whether we struggle to make sense of the shapes or we simply choose not to see them, this information hovers in the undefined negative space that allows us to acknowledge its presence while diverting attention elsewhere. These blind spots allow us to take up contradictory positions, reveling in our own ambiguity, asking for peace, yet refusing to arm, calling ourselves allies while refusing to listen. The experiences shared from Ukraine ask us to step out of this position and consider events from another side. Peter's sculpture was difficult to look at because Peter knows terrible things are terrible to look at. And when we are overloaded with too many of the same stories, we disconnect. This is the media fatigue Putin is counting on. It is the deaf ear we turn, and it is far more powerful than any propaganda the Kremlin is pushing. The only antidote to these informational black spots is not fact checking, but listening. I go back into the shelter, wrap myself in a blanket, pick up my phone again. I should save battery life, but I keep reading. The two men on the bench next to me are talking softly. Instinctively, I listen. What do they know and how? I no longer ask myself if it's true. I only ask whether I can endure this. Today, Kiev will be bombed. Today, Kiev will be surrounded. Today is still here, but there will be no tomorrow. How many more of these scenarios can I take? Would I be able to remain calm, to wait and see whether this new prediction comes true or turns out to be another lie? We are taught to think critically, to make informed decisions. In the chaos of the invasion's first days, I started to question whether that was even possible. We are lost, frightened. We don't know anything. Sometimes I think that I can only trust my ears, but they don't always hear the truth either. They hear explosions. A hit we tell each other in low voices. A hit echo the news channels. Who was it? Us or them? What was it? Did we shoot it down or did it hit the target? The only sound I can trust is the beating of my heart. Perhaps it is enough for now. Thank you. Um, I absolutely love how these pieces work together. I think that this uh, cross-cultural pairing has been an absolute success. Uh, there is something similar in the style these two writers approach their subject. Uh, also, I think they complement each other absolutely perfectly. And even if you look at the titles, how do you know on which side they end with a question mark? So there is this uh, correspondence even on, on this level. So I basically want to talk Phoebe and Lena how they work together and what they learned from each other and how their perspectives enhance each other's writing. So whoever is ready to begin and please let us know where you're based currently. Don't be shy, we've been through this. <laughs> I feel that Phoebe is ready to begin, but uh, uh, yes, mic on, brilliant. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think one of the things that worked really nicely when Lena and I were sort of talking about what we wanted to write about was we were both quite insecure of our topics. And on the one hand, I was sort of worried that mine didn't contain enough personal experience or emotion, that it was all very wordy and academic. And, and I think Lena on the other side was saying, oh, I'm, I'm worried that mine is too reliant on all this sort of like raw experience and personal emotion. And I was saying, no, that's what I want to bring into mine. So we had this really nice kind of realization that actually our pieces would be different. They would contain different things purely based on where we were and what we were experiencing. And actually that's kind of what's nice about writing these pieces together. And this is the same, I think, for all, all pairs that um, not every piece can do the same thing as what their partner's piece can do and they shouldn't that's not the point they're supposed to complement each other so it was very reassuring hearing my anxieties mirrored back at me <laughs> thank you um and Lena's piece is um of course based in the um underground parking during the uh, battle for Kiev uh, and it's it's a quite unique perspective so yeah I'm just curious what uh Lena what you've learned from from this collaboration uh, well, yeah, as Phoebe told, uh, it was uh, such a successful pairing because um, Phoebe's piece is just, it's so advanced and it works on so many levels. 
um, and offers so many deep reflections academic wise. And it just allowed me to, you know, to just go along with the personal story and call it a day. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, I think I, um, from, from the very beginning, I was very worried if I have anything to say on this topic. And I decided that the best um, way for me to make it work is just to tell my story, like to, to offer my personal experience and hope that um, people will somehow resonate with it. Um, so yeah, that, that that's how it was. <laughs> and uh, Olena's personal experience turns out to be very intellectual and very thoughtful. So I can't recommend reading it uh, enough. Uh, also, I just love how all these writers complement each other. Uh, we had an amazing time during those six weeks over the summer, as um, I'm sure all of you now um, sort of intuit. Um, I think it's time for us to discuss our work in um, a general q and I'll have uh, probably one question for you so that our audience uh, warms up and prepares their questions. And the question will be quite general. Basically, uh, how has the experience of Ukraine Lab changed your views of Ukraine or your um, approach to your writing? And uh, whoever is ready to tell us about their experience, just raise your hands and we'll pass the mic to you. Um, Chris? Well, I, I, I feel that maybe it would be more appropriate to say that the experience of working with Ukrainian writers in Ukraine Lab has only reaffirmed what I already knew about Ukraine uh, and about Ukrainians and Ukrainian literature and, and and all of uh, everything that entails. Um, I still, I feel very, even though Ukraine is very much in the world's focus right now, uh, politically, in the media and such, um, the world is yet to discover all of these sort of wonderful jewels of Ukrainian literature and, uh, and other expressions of culture, whether that be music or film or theater, or whether it be culinary or art or um, I think a very a very important lesson Ukraine has for the rest of the world certainly for the rest of Europe uh, right now is um, I think you define and you, you define yourself and you and you agree on the principles you have as a society through your cultural products. And if you want to be brave, if you want to be democratic, if you want to be uh, fair, like all of these things, which, which everybody, at least in conversation, agrees are, are, are good things to have. Well, it's one thing to talk about it, but how do you teach people to be truthful, to be democratic, to be reasonable, to be creative, to be whatever you... You, you, in my opinion, you do that through culture. You, you transmit these ideas through culture. And uh, Ukrainians are really inventive in doing this. I mean, uh, in the West, they call it magic realism. For me, it's just how Ukrainians tell stories. Um, there's a great creativity in the yes, way Ukrainians process a narrative. So that's um, yeah, yeah, that's, that's about it. Uh, I totally agree with that. And... Uh, uh, there has been this poster traveling all over Europe, be brave like Ukraine, and I think we would <laughs> all like to agree with that, right? Uh, any other thoughts on on what has changed for you uh, in, in the course of Ukraine Lab or after Ukraine Lab? Maybe uh, in terms of your own writing, not only your views of, of the country you were writing about. Um, Kaita? Uh, I might add that for me it was challenging to write more about my personal experience and uh, I was all, all the time asking uh, how much myself I should put in this text, how much knowledge, how much embodiment uh, experience, um, like memories and so on, because I was thinking that it's too much, this is enough, it's... Uh, 
it would not be interesting to people uh, read this, but then uh, I gave up and I used a lot of um, my thoughts and my imaginations. And I think that it's also somehow contributed to this uh, poetic, as you mentioned before. And I really like when I was recording this, uh, the beginning of my text, I really like that it uh, looks like a poetry. Um, and I do not write the poetry. I think I'm not talented at this, but it gives me some courage to try to to use some other forms. And I think that this is also influenced by Tamara Hundarova and also my partner in lab, uh, because we talk a lot um, how it could be possible and joining the fun of uh, um, not boring research methods and not boring writing. And I think that he is also um, uh, doing quite a good job in this. So I think it's, it's a big contribution of Ukrainian lab for me. Thank you. I'd love that you lab has encouraged you to explore a more personal approach to writing. And I think uh, quite a few among us would, would resonate with this uh, answer. Um, um, I'll give the word to Sophia in a second. And, and I just want to encourage our audience to type their questions in the Q&A box. Uh, Sophia. Yeah, thank you. And for me, um... The main challenge for me, main challenge for me, it was fighting about the safe place, because of, of course, when you are going to, for example, Butcher, Pin Borodyanka, and places were hitting so much with a lot of uh, people's stories, like cruel st stories of cruelty. Of course, you have a lot of things to write about. Uh, and to have this passion to write about this, and just going back and this kind of psychotherapy to write about this. Um, but if I if I go some if I went somewhere with uh, no bench or no uh, ruins or something, I can't write about this. Like of course you are like going through something. But I I have no words to explain this. But Ukraine Lab gave me a great opportunity to write about like our happy moments, not write about dirty, not write about losing people, uh, losing people you love and like, and not about all this mess uh, Russia bring to our country, but write about really like about exactly happy the happiest moments of the beginning of the war and write about young people um, like me being 25 in Ukraine or around 25 just having their youth uh, laws because of Russia came into our country in 2014 and we haven't we were not like we were working so hard and as I mentioned before we are hedonists so we are trying to find any way to have some happiness and fun and parties but of course it influenced us greatly and for me it's so interesting to discover my generation and to write about the generation are going to rebuild this country and unfortunately, this mess is our responsibility to, till the end of our lives. Thank you so much, Sophia. Uh, what I always liked uh, about your approach to the lab and to your, your work in general is that you're always striving to be the most truthful witness and uh, you learn uh, how to witness and you take this uh, as your responsibility and i think that uh, your piece is a beautiful witness to what happened to Lviv and to um, you and to your friends at the very beginning of this war and yeah we, we, we could be happy at the darkest of times um johnny i think yeah it was i think like just echoing what everyone else has already said like it the ability to like write personally was something for me that was a new thing coming from a more academic background it was 
as Katya said, this kind of like more exciting kind of research that's, um, you know, not not as dry as I would usually do. And I was a bit worried about that at first and then really enjoyed it. And it's definitely changed what I want to do in the future. I want to write more like that and I, and enjoy writing like that more than I do my normal job stuff. Um, but my, my piece was like based, based on research and what I learned was I spoke to several people in Ukraine. I was in, I was in Ukraine during Ukraine lab and in the UK for a part of it, but I spoke to, you know, 10 Ukrainians as part of the research and all of whom were willing to give up their time and speak to me about this, like, you know, creative essay um, during the war, just that generosity to keep going. As Sophia was saying, like people wanted to keep going on with their lives and had the time to speak to me. And that kind of like, definitely Ukraine Lab helped me to process what was going on a lot, a lot more than I had been previously. That was obviously like massively helped by everyone here who we could speak really open with. Like from the first session, it was like kind of a group therapy thing going on, like from day one. And also like that, that wasn't just by mistake. It was, you know, several people came in and, and coached us through that, which like Sasha probably can talk about like the people that were invited to run these things and so yeah it was just like a it was massive for me I feel like I grew as a writer started to learn what I wanted to do with my writing more but also process this huge event and that was happening in everyone's lives and is still happening and I want to read more of your creative stuff and of everyone's creative stuff uh as someone who has uh, sort of semi-moved from academia to more alternative pathways, I can appreciate um, how inspiring it can be to write in this free way. Um, do we have more responses to this from um, Lena and Phoebe? And um, well, I, I can only repeat what everyone else is saying, is that how challenging it was for me to write a personal story, uh, because I mostly work as a journalist with other people's story, and I'm used to writing about other people's experience. And I thought that this is, uh, the Ukraine lab is like my chance to change that and to try to, to tell a bit about myself. Um, and having the support from you, Sasha, and from Phoebe, and from everyone from the Ukraine lab. Uh, it was just so rewarding. And um, I thought that this is this is the right time to, to go for it and to see what I can write. <laughs> Hooray, <laughs> that worked out perfectly. Um, Phoebe, would you like to chip in? Yeah, I think, I think the one thing I would add is that so much of what I got out of um, Ukraine Lab was the discussions with everybody during the sessions and a lot of it was we were talking about things that I'd sort of been conscious of you know for the last eight months but not really formulated or put into words and I, I don't know I think it's something that we're all probably quite familiar with that 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 process of consuming the news and and talking about the news and reporting on the news and we've got several journalists here in the group but it was something that I was so aware of in February of posting on Instagram stories or checking the number of people that had watched my stories or who was reposting, who was still paying Ukraine attention. Um, and these were kind of all things that I was super aware of and I wanted to talk about, but I wasn't really sure how to talk about them. And I think that's where the discussions with everyone else really helped, but also the sessions we had um, from the from the writers and, and the experts that came to talk to us. Um, and I think something that we've talked about here I mean Sasha you said that Sophia is sort of bearing witness and 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 that was a that was a major theme of like how we bear witness to our stories how we bear witness to other people's stories um and the session that really helped me was when Alessia did a session about theatre and documenting war because it was talking about all the things I've been worried about but hadn't really consciously registered and this thing of being a witness but being an active witness and making other people active witnesses um and i think that's sort of what i wanted to get to was how we actively consume things and how we then present the truth in a way that makes other people consume 
I won't use the word truth, but but consume the information we're giving them in a way that we feel is um, that delivers the message we want to deliver. So, yeah, it was just a lot of a lot of good discussions where everything kind of clicked into place. Thank you. Uh, and there is a question which we have uh, partly covered already, but I'll read it anyway. Katarina mentioned uh, finding courage and Sophia talks of safe places. Has your writing given you a network or community to make you feel supported? I guess the answer is a unanimous note here. And I'd like to read you one response that is not a question, but is nevertheless very interesting uh, from Natalie Matlak. Uh, this is not a question, but more, uh, an, but more an amazing appreciation for what you all have done and how it inspires me. My father was a refugee in the 40s after the Nazi invasion of Ukraine and, the, uh, and our family suffered subsequently because of the Soviet occupation. There was so much pain and suffering then and people said it would never happen again, but it did. It inspires me to write about his experience and mine, reconnecting with my culture and my family suffering now. Thank you so much for what you have done. One day I will have courage to face the pain and write like you. And now the actual question for all of you. Uh, who are the writers who have inspired your resistance? Right, and Sasha, I'm going to have to jump in first because I didn't hear the question. Could I ask you to repeat it? <laughs> Yeah. So the question is, who are the writers who inspired your resistance? Uh, Ukrainian or otherwise? Let's start with Ukrainians. Uh, Zidane. Brilliant. Sergei Zidane, definitely, because uh, especially his poetry. Um, the the thing that I, I think, like Zidane is kind of a quintessential whether he likes it or not, he's sort of become a quintessential, uh, an icon of this one in terms of writers, because number one, he's from Luhansk, Oblast. he's from, I believe, Starobilsk, um, which has been occupied this year. And then he, the, the city that he, he made his home, uh, Kharkiv, uh, uh, is, well, we all know um, how, how bad things have been there this year. Um, What's notable to me is that he's a he, he he writes about war, but rather than focusing on the actual hostilities, he focuses on the relationships between people and the way it affects people's relationships, the way it changes. It might turn people against each other. It might bring people closer. Um, but there's that incredible empathy that, that, that he has when he... he he writes about the way Ukrainians interact with one another in times of war. And uh, I'm thinking particularly of um, a, a one poem of his, uh, which, which I won't uh, quote in full, but uh, where he, one way he describes loving somebody is uh, being afraid for them. And that, um, it was always a very beautiful passage, but it only really connected for me uh, here, like living here in Lviv uh, during like recent attack, during uh, air raid sirens and all of these things, where I realized that uh, people living here, they're afraid, but never for themselves. It's always for other people. It's always for their spouse. It's always for their relatives, their neighbors. It's the, the fear is always for somebody else. It's never for themselves. Um, uh, we have it here in our building. Somebody set up a, um, an emergency kit in the lift so that if there's a power blackout uh, because of a bombing there, and, and you should be so unfortunate that you get stuck in a lift when the electricity gets cut off, you have everything at hand so that you can survive the blackout. Uh, which is an excellent example of that that um, that sentiment of to love somebody is to be afraid for them. So, I love this example so much. It's really thoughtful and moving. Um, and I think uh, Sophia wanted to jump in. Yeah, we are lucky to be in the city, me and Chris, we both, we are lucky to be in the city without blackouts. It was only one day, so we are really privileged. But basically, uh, I like 
day and a half uh, in my building. Uh, so uh, basically, um, I have a story to, uh, like, I must tell that it was so hard to start reading after the full scale invasion. Like, basically, we were not reading, we were not listening to music and watching no videos, no films, because it was so hard. Like, uh, these things are um, helping you escape the reality. But in this situation, it was quite dangerous to ex escape the reality at all. But I was I started to uh, read with uh, Philip Sands uh, East West Street. For me, it was like happy end book because of like it's ending with a tribunal. So uh, now we are like all of us is expecting for a tribunal and working on the future tribunal um, and. Also, uh, but I haven't uh, read like I uh, after I was reading Peter's book, uh, Peter's Pomeranzi books, and some books connected to propaganda and Russia because so it was connected to my work. But I started to read after my friend; uh, he has joined as armed forces after the twenty first, like basically in twenty fives. He asked me to read him a poem. So now I'm reading the best Ukrainian poem uh, of 20th century, like Stus, who was uh, who who died in 18, 1985 in uh, Russia concentrative camp. Basically, I'm going through the Ukrainian poets and. Um, after reading these uh, pieces after the full scale invasion and me like was kind of connected to some struggles, uh, I, re I realized that sometimes people are telling the Ukrainian uh, independence in something was presented to us, like um, or Lenin has created Ukraine on, on a lot of this like uh, propaganda stuff, but reading this. Um, poems of people died really young especially in 30s you realize that our independence is built on blood and russia wants more blood more ukrainian blood to build its empire and it's quite important to go to like it's not roots but some of the texts that just to remind these people were also happy loving and hedonist as all ukrainians are I love ending on this note with you, Sophia. Um, and I think uh, Katerina wanted to add something. Yeah, I uh, I agree um, with um, with that fact that Jadan is very important to us right now. And for me, he is important since uh, 2007 when I started be uh, a student in Donetsk and. Um, in this way, yes, I start looking and read Ukrainian contemporary literature. And he, of course, was the iconic hero for all the Eastern Europeans, uh, scholars and, you know, young people. And uh, that fact that he's still in Kharkiv and he helped uh, and his brilliant speech in uh, Germany recently, I think it gives us a lot of um, inspiration. and. Um, um courage and uh, power as well but also i would say that for me very inspiring to see uh not it's not connected only with literature but what all people doing in ukraine now and how do they work and how do they think and that that still like being in, even in blockout in kiev they're still doing something creative uh writing, um, doing music, um, and doing their permanent job and everything that they did before the war and full-scale invasion. And even more, the war and full-scale invasion gives them more rage and uh, power to create these new pieces with a new, um, I don't know, uh, just maybe more deeply and more I would repeat it again creatively, but like more vividly. And the last but not least, that in the Ukrainian army fo forces now lots of writers, and which inspires me a lot is that still being in the front line and fighting, they write into New Yorker, to many other foreign uh, magazines who like trying to find someone brilliant, someone more famous, um, 
and of course they're saying yes because they know that today we have this privilege to speak and we can be uh, heard by many people uh, but not even because of that i think that they really want to speak about the situation and be in behalf of all other people who cannot speak and who cannot emphasize all of these issues that we have now so i really want to encourage you to read uh, artem Chekh and artem chapai two female um writer sorry male writers and uh, soldiers as well and it's also interesting to me that they not present in ukrainian soldiers as someone who um, you know, have no emotions or who cannot be insensitive or something like this. They show in completely another angle of being Ukrainian soldiers and that it means that you are very far from your families, that you are very far from your kids, but you want to be with them. And this is gives lots of inspiration for all of us who now uh, abroad and who trying to communicate from this side about Ukrainian situation that we're still on the one boat and we're still, you know, uh, trying to do our best for our victory. Thank you, Katya. And uh, we have time for Johnny to add his thoughts. And uh, may I ask you to be reasonably brief because we are running out of time. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think there's a, there's an easy answer that's a bit cliche, but it's it's very true that everyone here, the four Ukrainian people on this call, and um, one who's probably watching, like I just reading each other's pieces together was like really phenomenal, and following all of Sasha's work was really good. And I think those the, these people are actually the people who I learn most from. But then, as, as Katya was saying, like people who are not necessarily writers but artists and architects like Nikita Kadan writing about how to engage with Russian artists during the war was f f like really interesting to me and really powerful um and, and and musicians that I used to listen to when I lived in Kiev like John Object these people who are posting on Instagram like daily stories from the front line it's just quite yeah not not, not literature you know but stuff reading every day that is very powerful Thank you so much. And um, I guess this is the time for me to unfortunately say our goodbyes, but first to say our thank yous. Thank you so much to the uh, amazing questions from the audience. I've not had time to read all of them, but I will pass your thoughts and uh, your uh, questions to the writers. Maybe they will uh, have a chance to get in touch privately. Uh, thank you to the brilliant writers of Ukraine Lab. It's been such a joy to see your faces again. Thank you so much for your amazing work, which I think is very important. And I recommend to everyone who has not yet done this to read all the pieces. Um, and thank you to our partners uh, who've made uh, this project possible. The uh, Ukrainian Institute that is in Kiev, uh, Pan Ukraine, um, British Council and of course the British Library who have hosted this fantastic event. Thank you. It's been a privilege to be in this space under the black and white uh, logo of the British Library and I hope it's not the last time that we are doing something like this together. Um, thank you all. Uh, Slava Ukraini.